And before we begin, we'd like to focus our energy to honor those whose lives have been mostly direct, most directly impacted due to the injustice of the criminal legal system. The families who've lost loved ones, the voices that have been silenced, and the young folks that were only just beginning their journey. My name is Laurente. I currently live at the Juvenile Youth Detention Center. I'm 16 years of age. How can you identify someone as a dangerous community when they haven't hurt anyone? Does race play a role in this? Because I've noticed in court, it's always white versus black. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, that those clips were um, from Laurente, um, who participated in our youth forum uh, that we hosted um, for the county prosecutor race a few years ago. And so we just wanted to bring a voice um, and a face um, into the space and to think about the power um, that happens with that voice, you know, and the, that even though um, Lorante was in a correctional facility, that he was able to share that um, with us there. So um, I think a lot of the questions that, the question that he raises um, is really connected to what we're talking about today and uh, see it as helping to ground our work um, as well. So. Uh, good evening. I'm Desiree Simmons. I am one of the co-directors for the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. And uh, just to, to say a little bit about ICPJ, uh, ICPJ centers racial and economic justice uh, as we address the root causes of violence from oppression, poverty, environmental devastation, patriarchy, and war. And so within that work, um, we have been focusing on uh, the criminal legal system and, and uh, working for more justice here locally, um, as well as wherever we can connect with folks in solidarity. So that's ICPJ. Uh, and I'll say hello to Tad. Hi, I'm Tad Weiser, representing Washtenaw Regional Organizing Coalition. Um, we're just, we're th excited and proud to be a part of this uh, event tonight. And uh, <clears throat> if you haven't heard of We Rock, you know we're we're a uh, we bring together faith, labor, community organizations, and individuals. And our vision is is to use our organizing process to create opportunities for more people of color, lower income residents, and youth to participate at the tables where decisions affecting them and the broader community are made so that we're developing effective strategies for dismantling the structures that stubbornly maintain injustice, racism, and economic equality in our area. And I'll turn it over to Pastor Harold. Um, good evening, thank you for coming. Um, I'm here as a representative of the Washington Faith Leaders Forum. Um, a group of over 60 um, faith leaders from um, various faiths around the county um, who came together in about 2016. Um, what motivated us to begin this process was our understanding that as faith leaders, God calls us to take a stand against injustice and to defend the cause of those who are victims of oppression. And the repeated revelation of the killing of and use of force against people of color 
um, let us organize in order to make sure the protocol practices and procedures are in place in our county police agencies to ensure that the rights and lives of civilians are protected and respected. And so our mission is to establish the countywide interfaith advocacy effort with a, a faith-inspired platform that fosters mutual respect and effectiveness as we mobilize and speak up for justice and equality. And I'm passing it back to Eleanor, I believe now. Yeah, so does I'm going to bring up your presentation that you have to share with folks. Just give me a second. All right, so as the presentation is pulled up, um, I recognize that uh, folks have different might have uh, different understanding of the crew report itself. Um, some of y'all read it right when it came out. This still might be new for some others of you. Um, and so I want to, we're gonna do like a really quick overview, um, but I'll say that um, for tonight, we're focusing in particular on the courts. So the information that you'll see on the slides are most relevant to to uh, the court info and not as much to the prosecutor info but just to know that within the crew report that we um, examined publicly available criminal case data from the Washtenaw County Circuit Court to assess if racial disparities existed in charging and sentencing and so we specifically looked at uh, uh, data around uh, the, pro the prosecutor's office and the courts. Um, and we also within the report, while we didn't have uh, publicly accessible data um, in terms of from law enforcement, we did raise some questions. There were some things within the data that you know, we knew that we needed further information. And so there is some of that within the report as well. The report includes, oh, sorry, can you go back for just a second? Um, it includes many questions and areas of, for further exploration due to lack of information available or, or resource constraints. And we examined um, common categories of non-capital felony cases um, filed between 2017 and 2019 and all specified felony cases filed between 2013 and 2019. And so in total, we focus on 11 case categories. And just to say too, that the work um, for this report was done by a number of volunteers, um, as well as a statistician um, that made sure that um, the work was uh, sound. So I uh, just want to look at a, a few of the recommendations um, that we put forward um, in terms of for the judiciary. Um, we wanted to uh, first call for an equity audit uh, that is public and transparent to better assist voters in decision making. And I want to just uh, say that um, I'm aware that uh, the court currently has been working with um, uh, the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan um, with CJARS um, to do some work. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of pull from this email. They're supposed to be doing, um, uh, looking at uh, these different, uh, I'm sorry, looking at uh, the court in terms of determining about racial disparities and sentencing um, within their work, they will also um, be taking into consideration sentencing agreements, um, which we did not have access to. So things like, um, and in the final breakdown of the data, and then this and that this is something that needs to be coded by the court. And so it will take additional time before this is ready to go out. And so um, in terms of the timeline, I've been trying to keep tabs of when uh, CJARS turns their information over to the courts um, to get a sense of when, how long that might take before the public would be able to see that information and data. So it seems that they're making some movement on, on that. Um, 
also, we recommended that they study the 23 instances identified and address questions raised. So within the report, we um, identified uh, 23 instances of individual disparities in um, our outliers and minimum and maximum terms for imprisonment or probation and the type of punishment scheduled. So whether it's probation only or jail or prison that came up when looking at um, the sentences handed down through the through by the judges. Um, and so we wanted there to be further study of those 23 instances and to address questions that we laid out about those specifically. Um, in particular, um, Judge Archie Brown uh, accounted for 13 of those 23 instances um, of disparities. And so uh, because of the striking uh, number of cases, uh, we wanted to see immediate action um, taken and um, that has not yet happened. Um, we will say, I will say that um, um, when looking at the oversight um, of racial disparities and decision making by the Judicial Tenure Commission, this is the group that is kind of, um, they kind of put, they, um, they're responsible for investigating complaints of judicial misconduct and judicial incapacity um, and for recommending discipline of judges by the Michigan Supreme Court. One thing to note is that currently um, the Michigan canons, which are kind of like the rules uh, that the judges um, abide by, do not explicitly cover bias and prejudice. And so, um, and so that's a concern that we have. And so we wanted to see that addressed. Um, but I will say too that the, um, there, there was a complaint filed to the JTC um, on Judge Arch about Judge Archie Brown, and that is yet to um, receive a response. And that was over a year ago. And since then, um, Eleanor with ICPJ and Natalie Holbrook with AFSC did an op-ed um, about that. And so um, trying to still get some movement there. And then I uh, just wanna share uh, some of the things that we had under additional analysis. So um, as I said, within, when we were going through the um, process with the crew report, there was a lot of uh, information that we did not necessarily have to answer all of the questions that we put forward. And so um, some of these things might be, are things that we hope uh, others in the community want to um, help to, um, uh, engage with more. And so I just want to give a couple of examples. So uh, one we have here, uh, why are people of color sentenced to life in prison for homicide uh, in a disproportionate manner? Uh, and so here we have 44.1% versus 27.3% uh, European Americans. And so, and these are focused on uh, the 265 capital felony cases that we analyzed um, that uh, people of color uh, of the there are 50 cases that ha had homicide charges um, and 45 of those cases resulted in a homicide conviction and um, uh, 27 were sentenced to non-life sentences and 18 were given life sentences. People of color made up 83.3% of those convicted of homicide sentenced to life in prison compared to only 27.3% um, of those who are European Americans. Um, and so we see this as an area that needs further study. Another area that we note um, is around the use of habitual offender designation. And so um, there are um, uh, people of color were charged as habitual offenders far more often. Um, and the habitual offender designation has a multiplier effect. And so there's four different categories of habitual offender. Um, and 
it can add time, but it also is something that the prosecutor um, can uh, add discretionarily at their discretion. And so we had questions around how often was this um, accepted or not accepted um, uh, in, in those different ways. So there's a lot of questions around the use of habitual offender determination. Another question we have, uh, why are people of color more likely to have their charges dropped with no convictions of any kind? And so um, this is uh, a pretty important because a lot of times uh, people would be, um, you know, jailed for a certain amount of time, but then they have the charges dropped. But that does not mean that their lives were not disrupted during their time. That time um, of the, there were 12.6% of the capital felony cases um, in our data set in which charges were dropped and a defendant was not convicted of any charge. People of color made up 76.8% of that group. Um, and uh, European Americans made up 12.5% of that group. Uh, and then there were 10.7% um, where there was no race um, information provided. And so um, again, we wonder about what are the practices within law enforcement and the prosecutor's practices that account for these um, disproportionate impacts? Um, what explains charging people only to release them um, at that number? And recognizing that, again, the impact that happens even if charges are dismissed, where it could have put their housing into, um, into trouble or their job or even custody of their children. So um, that was another big area of question. Um, the next one, far more people of color are charged with resisting arrest and wondering, does this indicate bias in arrest by law enforcement and or charging by prosecutors? Um, and so with that, there were, uh, there's a, um, 172 uh, people of color who were charged um, with resisting arrest and only 56 European Americans were charged with that. And so there's a 200.7.1% difference there. Um, and uh, uh, people of color then are seven times as likely to be charged with uh, resisting arrest. And we wonder about, again, lots of questions around what that could mean. What accounts for more severe placement? Uh, so where people were either uh, uh, um, sentenced to prison or jail for assault with intent to commit great, great bodily harm. Uh, and so again, um, when looking at this, it shows about 95% of people of color are sentenced to prison within this area. Um, and for European Americans, 62% uh, are sentenced to prison and 37% to jail. So we wonder again about these disparities in placement. And then uh, why does a judge depart from the sentencing guidelines? Do, do the guidelines reflect bias themselves? So trying to get a better sense of what happens when again, um, a judge does go outside of those guidelines that they um, have the option to adhere to or not, and um, whether that reflects bias, um, and then also whether the guidelines reflect bias. So there's a few things there. So there's a lot more um, that's in the report, but just wanted to give you all a sense of some of the things there and some of the different kinds of questions that we raised. I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Summers. I'm the pastor of the Episcopal Church of the Incarnation. Um, and I'm to talk a little bit about responses to the crew report. Um, so first thing I'd just say, initially, we had what seemed like a very good reception. Um, almost immediately, Ellie Savitt, who was running for prosecutor, and Chief Judge Carol Kunke sent out a statement welcoming the report and seeming to affirm the need for our community to follow up on it and act on it. 
We had really good press about it. The Free Press started its series on criminal justice reform, focused on it, wrote a very powerful editorial calling on other counties to, to do similar studies. We had good responses, community gatherings, where lots of people seemed anxious to, to engage and figure out how to address the injustices the report highlighted. Um, among other things, we collaborated with some folks from the University of Michigan Art School to illustrate the report. You can see those th their work on Crew's website. Um, it was also important that Ellie Savitt's decisive electoral victory seemed to show that people in our county were definitely ready for significant criminal legal reform. And partly because of all that positive response, Crew applied for and received a $200,000 grant from the Michigan Justice Fund to hire uh, an outside body to kind of gather everyone around the table to see where and how we could address the kinds of racial disparities we find in our county's criminal legal system, uh, both in terms of key institutional leaders, community service providers, and activists. And initially, uh, that report that we had very positive response to that. It became what's called the Washtenaw Equity Partnership, and the uh, money was used to hire the Vera Institute, which is one of the leading reform organizations in our country uh, that's worked with cities around the country to help lead us through this process. Um, do you want so so you can see these are the the sub committees or the key committees of the Washington Equity Partnership are the prevention and front end, uh, looking at racial disparities there and how we might address them, what happens in court, how we might address the racial disparities we find there, what happens with post-sentencing and re-entry, uh, also looking at the question of youth in the schools and behavioral health issues, and finally looking at uh, issues of data. So, but behind the scenes, things were clearly more complicated. We began to hear uh, from some individuals, uh, such as some of our judges, who questioned our data and seemed really defensive. And since our data was based on their data, we were happy to see the data deepened and clarified. I will say we did not expect to see the work in this area put on hold while that data was pursued, as our data simply confirmed, you know, that our county was, what was going on in our county is very similar to what was going on in the rest of the country. So uh, it shouldn't have been that surprising. And it's certainly not responsing, surprising for anybody who's been in a courtroom in Washtenaw County. Um, Rather than responding by coming together to see what we could do about so obvious a problem, uh, we began to encounter this increasing defensiveness among uh, kind of local institutional leadership, people feeling like we were accusing them of being unfair, ra uh, rather than focusing on this as an issue of systems in need of reform. Um, I began to sense that rather than just individual responses, there seemed to be some kind of mobilization going on to try to slow down or even undermine some of the movement towards reform. I hope I'm wrong on that. It does not appear that I am. Um, and so, and right now, uh, we have seen uh, our county administrator who was the co-chair of the Washington Equity Project, uh, pull out of being part of the project and sending out a letter saying that the county was no longer uh, backing the project. Um, I have yet to hear whether the County Board of Commissioners ever met to discuss that or whether that was just a statement on her own part. But in response, almost all of the county leaders pulled, county institutional leaders pulled out of the process um, except for those from the prosecutor's office and except for a number of individual judges. Uh, 
as near as I can tell, it seems they had preferred to, these institutional leaders would prefer to receive, oversee reforms on their own without the hassle that comes with the process that includes people with differing perspectives and people from the community. Um, I still, having been involved in a very positive process of having institutional leaders come together with community service providers and community activists when we, we pull together the prisoner, Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative in our county, I'm still hoping you know, we may find a way to work forward, uh, move forward, because otherwise, uh, you know, it seems we're we're really going to be at loggerheads if one group of us has has reviewed all this data, come up with suggestions for reform, and this other group has stood apart from the process, has not looked into these things, and then is going to argue uh, that we shouldn't pursue those reforms, having never really looked at them. So, um, you know, as near as I can tell, those who are, are pulling back from the process are arguing uh, that we need to go slowly, that if we don't go slowly, we'll either make mistakes or the reforms won't have a lasting impact. Um, but others of us feel that the need for reform has never been clearer. And if we don't act now, it may be a long, long time before, before we ever have this kind of opportunity again. Um, and again, we're talking about how Washtenaw County is contributing to the system of mass incarceration, which has been one of the greatest sources of racism and racial discrimination you know, in our country over the last 40 years. So um, putting that a little bluntly, but, but we really, um, it's, it's heartbreaking to me to see folks who on the surface are saying they want to see reform and address racial discrimination and yet seem to be undermining this process and that, that we've invested so much in uh, from moving forward. So that's my piece. And, uh, oh, Desiree, you were going to see if there was something you wanted to add to what I said. No, I think that's great. I think we could go on to the, I think Donnell is next. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Donnell Weich. I'm the senior pastor at the Vineyard Church of Ann Arbor and the past president of ICPJ. Uh, I am also a co-coordinator with Jeff Harold and Chuck Wolfowski and Joe Summers for the Faith Leaders Forum. And Pastor Harold and I met with uh, Judge Kunky. Uh, this past October to bring some of our concerns uh, to her as the chief judge of the Washtenaw County Courts. Uh, our initial prompt was uh, the political article that detailed uh, the trials and tribulations that uh, a community member, Anthony Hamilton, uh, experienced in our criminal legal system. So we knew going into this meeting uh, what um, Reverend Summers uh, just mentioned, that there seemed to be some hesitancy from institutions uh, around the issue of the crew report. So we attempted to meet with uh, Judge Kunke without centering the crew report initially because we just didn't want to have a lot of objection. But we got right into the crew report within five or 10 minutes of our meeting. And we heard from the chief judge that uh, the, the court rejected um, the premise of the, re of the report, that it uh, looked at uh, the data and felt like there were gaps in the data, uh, that the data was inaccurate, that the data um, misportrayed uh, what was happening within uh, the court system. And so uh, Pastor Harold and I uh, asked, well, what has the court done to refute the data? It's been 11 months since the report has been issued. Uh, you can marshal the resources of the county uh, in order to do that. We were told uh, that there was a new dashboard that was supposed to be uh, institution uh, um, uh, installed, uh, but the state court administrator asked all the courts within the state to stop any individual efforts and to wait on the C jars, which uh, uh, Desiree some, uh, uh, talked about it in her opening statement that's coming out of the University of Michigan. So we sit in this place where we have the crew data, 
which paints this very clear picture of racial bias, but we have the court and the chief justice of the court saying that they don't believe that data and that um, there's not a reconciliation in that. So uh, Pastor Harold and I um, raised a number of issues. We asked for some basic changes that are within the court's purview. We were targeting one specific judge, Judge Archie Brown, uh, because it, our research determined that he was on average sentencing in Washtenaw County 25 black men to prison every month. I just want you to sit with that statement because that was stunning to me when I discovered that. And we raised this issue uh, with the chief judge. Uh, she denied that there was any racial bias happening in the Washtenaw County Court. She went as far as to say that she did not believe that any judge on the bench uh, um, demonstrated any racial animus or any bias. And she asked us to, in one sense, to prove it. She says no one had filed a complaint. Now, we didn't know at the time of our meeting that a complaint had actually been filed. Uh, and we asked why that information wasn't shared with the public. And uh, we were told that that wasn't something that we could have access to. We asked that when we have a justice who has shown clear racial bias and animus, could they be removed? Well, the thing we discovered is that there is a rule in the Washtenaw County Court that was established in the 80s that says that when you become when you come before the court, you see the same judge for your life before the court. We asked that the chief judge rescind that rule or create a mechanism for someone to change a judge if they've demonstrated racial bias or animus. We were told that she was not convinced that that was necessary because there is no racial animus in our court system. So Pastor Harold and I, unsatisfied with our meeting, we wrote a letter to the state uh, court administrator, who is the person who oversees the court system within Michigan, and we copied the Supreme Court Justice, uh, just, uh, Judge McCormick, on our complaint. Um, I will, if, if everyone's okay, I'm happy to share the letter that we wrote in complaint. And then we received a response about a month later because we were asking that the chief judge not reappoint uh, Judge Kunke to uh, the chief judge position in Washtenaw County. Uh, we were told after the decision had been made that they rejected um, our concerns and said, we have to wait and see about the data. We don't believe that the data that Crew has presented accurately represents what's happening in the court. Pastor Hurl said it best. It seemed as if the Black lives that hung in the balance were the willing trade while we decide whether or not what we find to be true in our courts is actually true. I'm grateful to the Crew a team of the Washtenaw Equity Partnership, which I'm on one of the subcommittees for reentry, and all of you who are doing incredible work so that we can actually live in an actual, just multiracial society. But there is significant institutional obstacle to that. Uh, there is someone who is following me. It's Brian. Brian, you are up. Brian Foley. First of all, uh, good evening, and um, thank you for allowing me to participate in this forum, this discussion. Um, I was invited yesterday, kind of late in the evening by Hazelette Crosby as a uh, representative of the community um, and someone who has been before the courts. And if you don't mind, I'll just uh, qualify myself as a couple people I know, and uh, I don't think too many people know me. Um, I'm soon to be a 62 year resident of Ypsilanti, in particular the south side of Ypsilanti, where I was born and raised and uh, lived here all my entire life, except for the time I spent in the military and the time I in, spent in prison. Um, I'm a member of an organization which is called Supreme Felons Incorporated. And Supreme Felons Incorporated's responsibility, our duties are our mission statement 
is, is that we help try and reduce the recidivism rate. And we try to get our men and women who have been released from prison, get them acclimated back into society by trying to supply food, clothing, shelter, and jobs. The other part of our mission statement is we try to keep our young men and women from going before the courts, seeing police by engaging in their lives and their activities, in their families even, and their schools. Um, currently, we were, we're working with the uh, ACES school and we're working with the uh, juvenile uh, courts with their relationship with YS, uh, WYSD and with ACES and Ypsilanti Community Schools. We have uh, at least two of our members who actually work inside of the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Department working with the youth. We're kind of a unique um, set of uh, men and women. We call ourselves Supreme Felons because we've all been convicted of felonies, spent time in state institutions as well as federal institutions. And we changed our lives around and we're dedicated to uplifting and bettering our community. And so that's what we do. So to date, um, I can speak of, since we've been an organization, we have kept close to 300 men and women from going to prison and two to 300 men and women, we've either got them re-engaged back with their families, got them back into school, got them jobs. Of every person that we have worked with, not one of them has came back to the court again that we've been working with on a hands-on basis. So we've been having a pretty successful working relationship with the Sheriff's Department, as well as with the uh, new Washington County Prosecutor's Office. So uh, I've spoke with Pastor Jerry, I mean, Pastor uh, Harold last night, excuse me, and I'm just gonna share you with my story. Um, I was arrested maybe uh, 30 years ago for the possession of a uh, 0.025 little gram of cocaine. At that time in my life, I hadn't been convicted of a, a felony, pretty much uh, traffic warrants and stuff like that was my only relationship with police. So I got arrested with 0.025 of gram, which is that much cocaine. And I wasn't charged for distribution. I wasn't dope dealer during that time. Um, I wasn't possession, it was usage. And the prosecutor's office um, actually tried to send me to prison for five years with a $50,000 fine. And I was on my way to prison, literally. Uh, then very rambunctious, very good uh, prosecutor, excuse me, a defense, uh, defense attorney at the time, now Judge Elaine Washington, I was one of her first cases. And she seen, realized what was going on in that prosecutor's office at the time was headed up by Brian Mackey. And they were mm -hmm. trying to send me to prison. And she defended me to the, I mean, actually defended me. Um, she and I laughed about it back then because she reminded me like a Matlock or Perry Mason in her defense of me. If she hadn't advocated on my behalf, I would have went to prison at that time. But however, what happened to me at that point was I got the stigma of being a black man with a felony. And that's what they wanted to do with me because that was the intent. I can tell you that straight up and down, you know, for that much. Later on, um, issues I hadn't addressed, which I did address later on, were um, my substance abuse um, usage. And as they escalated more and more, my crimes got more and more um, involved, more intent um, because I couldn't, even though I was a licensed electrician and at the time I was a city of Ann Arbor electrical inspector, I was stuck there and I couldn't advance my career because I had the uh, stigma of that felony on me. And I was qualified to do all kinds of work and I couldn't get a job anywhere because of that stigma. Depression, 
anxiety, all that good stuff, which elevated to full-blown substance abuse, which led uh, into more trouble. And I'm finding myself uh, uh, committing more violent crime, crimes, armed robbery, bank robbery, and where I spent some time in federal prison for those, for those charges. When I got out of uh, federal prison, um, child support had backed up on me. And I was arrested for another crime. And I went before Judge uh, uh, Donald Shelton at the time for felony child support. The prosecutor's recommendation that I do time six years for child support. <clears throat> and they were trying to send me up for six years, literally, for child support. And it wasn't I was in ducking child support. I actually, when employed, I was playing child support. It was the times that I wasn't working that the meter be, continued to run. At the time of my allocution, you know, Sheriff, excuse me, um, <laughs> Uh, Judge Shelton asked me to have the last words before imposed sentence. I had came into a plea agreement at that time with the um, then prosecutor's uh, office to do one year in the county jail for child support, non-payment. He asked me, did I have anything to say? And I said, yes. And I said, my issue was never to duck child support. That wasn't the issue. You can follow your records. You can see that Every time I was employed, I paid. This is the times when I wasn't working, wasn't I able to play because I had a felony and I couldn't work the times we were laid off from being um, work that was being constructed, being in the construction field. Those of you who know when the winter months come and when projects not available, you just don't go to work. And I couldn't get in a job anywhere else. So I explained that to him and he asked me a few questions and he sentenced to me then five months in the county jail with time served. We did it up to four months, meaning I was getting out of jail the next week. The prosecutor was so pissed at that time that the judge would hear and understand my circumstances and situation that they actually really almost threw a conniption that he only sentenced me to five months in the county jail for six months when they were seeking six years, excuse me, five months when they were seeking six years, that they wanted to put me on a tether, they wanted to put me on house arrest, they wanted me to pay fines, they wanted me to be on probation, you name it, they wanted to do all of that. But the judge let me go. I, what I did was it gave me the opportunity to address finally at that time, to accept the fact that I was a addict, I've been in the recovery process now approximately 12 years. And because of that opportunity that Judge Shelton got, gave me recognizing that, that's why myself and members of my organization have turned ourselves around. And through our life's experiences, we're able to reach our youth, our young men, our women, our home, because most of us all are from this community where we have relationships with uh, our community with the sheriff's department, with the prosecutor's office, with the Ypsilanti Police Department, where we're able to intervene in situations and gang violence, domestic violence, potential crimes and head them off before they get there. So that's just something I shared with uh, Pastor uh, Harold last night. And that's my experience uh, working before, uh, going before the courts as a citizen of here of Ypsilanti. So appreciate your time. And I just thank you uh, for, uh, invited me to this forum. I hope I had something positive to contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, like I said before, it, the data is the data and we really need to um, respect stories because that's really what, what should convince um, decision makers to, to make changes. Um, so I have a suggestion. Now we're gonna have a, a discussion um, if folks have questions, please put it in the chat and then we can, we can kind of go through things. Um, but I have a question for all of you that just spoke and what you, what you were talking about really made me think of um, just the different strategies and 
you know, Donnell, you're talking about the, the obstacles to, um, to some of the strategies. So which, which strategies do you think would be most um, winnable at this point in time as we continue to work on other, other strategies? You know, is that the Judicial Tenure Commission? Is that dealing with issues around the chief judge? Is that um, dealing with issues of the canon? What things do you think would be most successful to get to get more momentum and more attention on the issues? Is it okay if I respond? Sorry, I didn't know if you were asking everyone or just me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there are, I would recommend uh, three things. One, um, I think it's important for us as citizens to watch what happens in the court. So we need court watchers. One of the things that we brought to the chief judge was the court feed for Archie Brown's court would cut out and there would be no mechanism to get it restored. Um, and so it was the first time she had heard about it, though there were written complaints. Um, when I raised my own issue, she connected me with the right person and I was able to get access to that court. So um, I know the court's going back in person, so it might not be an issue of Zoom, but we definitely need community members to show up and be present in the court to hear what's saying. And I think the thing that impacted me the most about this, and I'm a pastor, so I'm not really short on words. So if I talk too much, just cut me off, um, was listening to the prosecutor respond to the judge when the judge asked, what do the people want? That is the response that the judge asked the prosecutor when people appear before the court. And it was just staggering to hear the prosecutor saying that we, the people, wanted this person incarcerated. We wanted their liberty taken away. We wanted them fined. We wanted them uh, stolen from their families. Uh, we wanted them warehoused uh, because I don't imagine that that's what we actually want. Uh, but if we're not present to hear, I don't think we can bear witness uh, to what's happening. Number two, um, I think the uh, documenting things. One of the things the chief judge said to us when Pastor Harrell and I met with her was, no one has complained. Now, we know that that's not true, but that was an easy reach for her to say there wasn't complaints that she could reference. And then she said, Archie Brown has run, you know, repeatedly um, uncontested. And so the people keep electing him to the bench. And I was like, it's only because they don't know what he's doing. If they knew what he was doing, they wouldn't send him back to that position. Um, and then number three, I think we have to, as a community, um, assert that all of this is happening in our name and that. Um, it, it's not just the tax dollars, but it's like, it's the reality of the community that we're trying to build. And I am not safer because, you know, Brian was uh, incarcerated for five months. It actually did harm to our community that he wasn't able to continue to be in our community, to support his child, to be uh, at his job, to be present with his friends. That did not make me safe. And I think we have to let those who hold this power know that we are re-envisioning what it means for us to be safe. And the court is on the wrong side of this. It is the only institution that is not moving in a progressive way. We have a new county commissioner. I mean, we have a new prosecutor. We, we've elected you know, new leaders to, to move forward our progressive values, but the court is stuck and it is not moving. So those would be the three things. I'd recommend. Um, I will follow up with what um, Donnell was saying. Um, um, this is Pastor Jeff Hill, New Beginning Community Church of Washington County and Faith Leaders Forum. Um, for those of you who um, missed the introductions, um, I think it's really important for us to understand 
what goes on in our courts and the power of a judge to sentence. Um, when we listen to um, Brian's story um, about his life, um, I was on a call um, uh, Monday morning with um, a gentleman out of Detroit um, who said he stole a purse out of a white woman's car and was sentenced to 25 to 100 years in prison. Um, now you process that, 25 to 100 years in prison for stealing a purse. And so we hear law and order, we hear keep the streets safe, but our fellow citizens are coming before courts and we really have no what they're facing, um, how long they're there. I've done jail ministry for a quarter century and the um, 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 statistic Desiree was talking about, about how long you can be in jail and you've never been sentenced for a crime. You haven't even been tried for a crime. Um, and people are in jail for months. Um, when the prisons got crowded, they up jail sentences from um, um, one year to 18 months. And we have citizens sitting in jail coming for judges and motions to get them released are being denied. Um, and they're just sitting in jail and they haven't even been to trial yet. And so the power of judges is incredible. And um, we see their names on the ballot and we have no idea who they are. And we sometimes vote blind or we just maybe, well, I'll pick one or there are two incumbents. Well, let me just vote for both of them. I don't know. And we keep going. And only when a member of our family someone we know has to face the court system, does the reality of what to go before a trial judge um, and the power that has um, settles in on us. And so one thing I would really advocate is um, education on who is running. Um, um, I will put something in the chat about the judge positions open in our county in the 2022 election. Um, and um, hopefully what we'll be able to do as we move forward with some of our um, coalitions is have more sessions with um, judges about who they are, what their platform is. And hopefully when you um, are in this conversation, um, you will know some of the things and some of the issues to raise with judges. Des, what do you, what about you? The strategies that you that you think that should be focused on? Um, I feel like I'm not prepared really to, to answer that question because there's so many things. <laughs> um, you know, and so just like co-signing a lot of what folks uh, are saying. I was just about to put in the chat that. Um, uh, the ICPJ Vote Caucus um, is actually working on um, looking to do some uh, candidate scorecards uh, focused on racial and economic justice. And so I'm sure there will be questions um, related to uh, the legal system and, and other areas of justice. And so we, um, for the November, uh, elections, we will, we are planning on focusing on the judge races. And so if that's work that folks are interested in, definitely connect with us there. Um, and we also are planning on doing one focus um, at um, for the primaries. And so we will be looking, we still have to confirm which races we're going to be focused on um, for those races, for those, for the primary. Um, although we will likely, um, so anyhow, so, so that, so if folks are interested, I'll put the information for, um, for the full caucus and you can also connect with me, um, to get put on our list. Um, if that's an area of work that you're interested in, um, pursuing. Thanks. And I know, uh, Ms. Audrey, you had, you had questions about the data and I, I thought, um, you know, as we're all advocating and organizing, really having an understanding of what their, what the, the obstacle is that is being put out there, I think is really important. So can you, can you talk about your question and what you want to know about 
the data. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. I just saw your question in the um, in the chat. No, that's okay, Eleanor. Uh, thanks. I I was responding to uh, Joe speaking about um, the data being pursued. I I took that as true. Doing more of a drill down, if you will, in terms of the data. Um, uh, another analysis, uh, someone uh, who works with data, uh, analyze data. And so I just wanted more clarification in regards to his statement. Uh, that uh, they pursue the data more, or you all, crew, if you will, pursue the data more. So that's why uh, that I had that question. So yeah, I'm happy to address that, Audrey, and I might have been not as clear as I could have been. So one, the judges decided to review our data and I think hired somebody to do that, uh, and we haven't ever heard back whether what they've come up with is different. The county prosecutor has meanwhile also pursued a grant to get the Vera Institute to work with the prosecutor's office to try to deepen and extend the data. And that's also an important part of the Washtenaw Equity Project is going to be, you know, to get more data. I mean, we only were, were able to look at some areas. We really wanna, you know, we really need to know where the racial disparities are happening at each aspect of our system, you know, whether it's in terms of policing, arrests, prosecutor decisions, judge decisions, probation, parole decisions. So there is a lot more data that would be helpful. Um, and, and our, you know, at least I know the prosecutor's trying to get it and the Washington Equity Project's gonna try to get it. I also just want to add one thing about strategies and next steps too. So right now, I believe that the Washtenaw Equity Project's timeline is to come up with, Desiree, I'm always bad on dates and times, so maybe you'll have a better sense of this. But, you know, it's within a year we're to come out with these recommendations, you know, hopefully best on, based on best practices around the country on how we intervene at these different points at which racial disparities are showing up. And, you know, when those recommendations come up for how our county can act, uh, you know, to, ad to address these racial disparities, we need to really show up and act, uh, particularly if the county leadership is not following through on these professed commitments to really acting on them. I mean, hopefully they'll they'll accept this, but the fact that they've pulled back from the process certainly makes me nervous. Uh, so I'm just saying we, we have an end goal in sight. It's not gonna last forever. When those recommendations come up, you know, I feel like they're gonna be a blueprint for change that we need to act on. Can I just, um, thanks for saying that, Joe, because I do think it's going to be important um, that as this, as the work uh, flows out, because I think we're, we're, we're going to be working on getting these uh, recommendations, I think, by the end of this year. I mean, the um, grant was only for a specific period of time. And so um, we'll only have Vera for a short, <laughs> for that time. And uh but I think that once it comes time, once we get those recommendations out, um, that it will we will need a lot of a community engagement and support, um, not only backing the recommendations, but to try to get funding, to secure funding for the work that it will take to actually um, pro, you know, proceed with those those recommendations. Okay, I saw um, some conversation in the chat around the county commissioners. Um, and so 
Can folks speak to what it is that we should be talking with commissioners about, um, specifically um, in the chat? I believe that um, that it was said that that there was there was no agreement to participate in the first place, and that's not what the county commission is going to do. So, what is it that that folks can be talking to commissioners about? I'll, I'll, I'll start with a response. I, I just think we, we, you know, I'm hearing that, uh, you know, I know it's difficult working with community, you know, with all the differing conflictual opinions and feelings that exist within, you know, uh, people who are involved with these issues. But I just really think we need these county institutional leaders or people they designate to be part of this conversation. Otherwise, when these recommendations come out, you know, we're going to have to start all over again. So, um, so, so one thing is to call on, you know, our county leadership to instruct the, the leaders of these different institutions that need to be part of this con conversation to appoint people to be part of this process if the, if they're feeling they're too busy to do it themselves that 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 would be one thing i'd ask for anyone else i feel like this is just like repeating what i said but i'll say it again which is we need to talk to the commissioners about funding um, priorities that um, shift the paradigm that we're trying to operate within, um, and especially as they head into uh, focusing on their four-year budget, which they'll be voting on in November. And so that's something that we can be approaching the commissioners with now, and also just encouraging them to, um, you know, you know, to participate and to keep, keep, keep track of that work so that once it comes time you know that it's not like the question of the information right because we have uh so many experts and folks um you know both with lived experience as well as uh research uh background um coming together to pull this together so uh it would be a shame that we wind up if we wind up in the same place where people are doubting the data when there's opportunities to lean into that now so Thanks, Des. Um, and Ms. McGraw, I saw that you have your hand up. I, I don't know if this has already been addressed, but um, the question that I've often had is when things happen, um, I'll reach out and I'm not sure who's over what. Like, I'm not sure whether it's this is an issue for the county commissioners or for the prosecutor. And um, when I have asked questions, I tend to get like, well, that should, that was their, that person's fault or that person's. If this group or whomever could try to help um, regular community citizens know where to go to have questions or to vet concerns um, without having to uh, go through a maze because if you're not you know regularly talking to um, elected officials you might not know who does what um, or or where you can be heard thank you for that and I think um, I see that Miss Gale you have your hand up and she's one of the experts on that so um, if you're still with us Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Brian for sharing his story. Um, also, I think that you need to have realistic expectations of, you know, what pieces, what, what can you do to really make change? I'm listening to, um, the resistance that you're facing. And I don't think that you, you have to go backwards to understand how did we get here today? 
Um, as a county employee, I remember working in the county had a substance abuse coordinating agency. And at that time, I was in charge of licensing coming down with the state. And if the Lanny, we probably had 10 different substance abuse um, it, in just Ypsilanti, substance abuse organizations. And I remember hearing, you know, pipeline to prison, uh, privatizations of prisons. Um, and I can see it very clearly now looking backwards because prisons are private, which means for profit. All of the substance abuse um, agencies of help are gone. In this county, I think we have two and probably 25 years ago or 25, 30 years ago, we had, if you look backwards to see how many places of help were there for people, which are now gone. So it's very easy for them to go to prison, to go to jail. Um, I worked in uh, uh, Scott's. Um, uh, Scott's was a women's facility at the time. Um, and I saw the, the treatment, the women. I mean, and I was a worker to help with the women and the children so that there would be unification while their mothers are in prison so that the children did not repeat the same habits and just how I was treated as a worker just coming in and then getting to know the women. Um, what are our realistic expectations for change? Um, are you gonna change much? In my opinion, that answer is no because they're, they've strategically taken away everything that could help a person. Brian said, you know, you're on drugs. You have mental illness. For the people who are on drugs, where do they go? They go to prison so that the prisons can make the money. Mental illness. There, is, there aren't any services, so you can take a person with a mental illness who's never been diagnosed because there aren't any services for them today. So where are we gonna put them? In prison. So those are two things. Racism, it's, it's very real. Black people are going to have harder sentences for lighter crimes. And we've gotten this way, you know, it started many, many, many years ago. And now, just like when we think of George Floyd, the only reason that there was a movement is because it was taped and video. That happens every single day. So court watchers, you, you can watch and you can see what they do. I've been in courtrooms. I've seen um, people who have gone to prison. I can see the difference of if you have money and you can hire a top-notch attorney, the sentence will be you know, much lighter than somebody just trying to plea and just railroad into prison for, for um, you know, the rest of their life, basically, for minimal crimes. So I think we need to be realistic in the approaches of, you know, what you can, what you can do, what's realistic for any piece of change. Listening to Brian and telling his story there are hundreds of other people that you need to listen to their stories, understand, 
And then if you're documenting, you, you can sit in the courtroom and you can hear the difference between a person with a, a public defender that may not care versus a top-notch attorney. And you can see the difference between the two and see the sentencing. So I think that it's much greater um, than, you know, to even begin to equip yourself to challenge, to challenge the um, legal system. Thank you. So might I respond, um, um, Eleanor? Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the one value of, of of sessions like this is to help us understand um, that things don't have to stay the way they are. Um, um, years ago, and I would have to I would have to give him credit for this. I mean, years ago, um, um, Pastor Summers would begin to talk about prosecutors that did things differently and how we could get a different kind of prosecutor in this county um, that would change the way sentencing is done. And we have a different prosecutor. We have a progressive prosecutor um, that is changing up some things. We realize that prosecutors are prosecutors, okay? That is changing up some things, but that was because folks wanted something different and voted for something different. Um, Structures are there, but that don't mean they need to remain. And one of my one of my favorite quotes is a quote from Frederick Douglass, where he said, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out what any people will quietly submit to, and you'll find the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. And I think that it is possible for us to, in this county, as voters, demand something different. So um, um, I think it was, um, I don't know if it was Ms. McGraw that asked about um, um, what you can ask of the um, county commissioners or maybe someone else. Here's a novel idea. A prosecutor has a budget to prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. What if the public defender's budget, which is settled by the county, was equal to the prosecutor's budget? Would we get a different kind of defense from public defenders that could now match the budget of a prosecutor? That's just one thing that we can begin to think of because we don't have to accept things as they are. Um, when we're talking about judges, you're right, Gail. Um, Treatment centers are, 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 are few. And as um, it has been documented and, and, and testified to, people get different sentencing. But if we, with these judges coming up, and I put into the chat the judge sitting um, positions that are open, if the people we elected, we said, look, this is what we want. We want a different kind of sentencing structure from you. People hollered about private prisons. And right now, there are no private prisons in Michigan anymore. Private prisons, to my understanding, have been eliminated in the state of Michigan. So it is in our power to do something, but um, power can seize nothing without a demand, not an ask, not a will you please, not a if you can get around to it um, and analyze our data when you find the time somewhere in the year 2025. Uh, I will close by saying this. When we got the information back from the... Um, from the, um, from the um, um, state Supreme Court. Um, and we got the um, information back um, about the, um, the um, um, way that they're working to work with the University of Michigan. It's gonna take time to analyze the data. My response letter um, was, um, if you found out that somebody in the Washington County Court System was embezzling $100,000 a year because your accounting system could not track it. Are you telling me that you would now say, well, you know what, we need to get a whole new statewide accounting system together and we need to find out what's going on and maybe in the year 2025, we may be able to stop the bleeding. You shut that thing down immediately. 
you get a new system in, meaning that that money is not going out of the county system. Sometimes we look at things and we we just don't demand more. And I think this is our chance with the data and things that are happening. Um, and I understand it to say we want more. If I could just respond. Oh, please, Ms. Gale, go ahead. Okay. Voting is important. How many people, I mean, and that's why Ipsy Can I Share was created. And that's why every single day we work gently to teach people about the importance of voting. There is a difference in telling somebody you need to register and go vote and they have no idea who they're voting for. We have an incredible tool that is a talking ballot where people have never seen a Supreme Court justice. We just pick because it says pick one or two or three. So if many of us would work together and empower the people and give by giving them something instead of just saying register to vote and go vote, but with no tool of empowerment and how people, if they were empowered, then I could see change because people understand what it is that they, their vote does matter. So we have to quit telling people to just go vote and teach them how collectively, if we're empowered, if we see, if we have understanding that we could all do better and stand together instead of dividing. But so thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gale. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left and I wanna give more time to Pastor Harold um, to close us out. But Ms. McGraw, I see that you, you have another comment that you'd like to contribute. Would you like to do that first? Yes, I'll be brief. I just wanted to say that I was listening to um, uh, Ms. Summerhill and also to Reverend Harold. And I, I do think that there is a lot of history. You know, our family's been here for a long time and um but i've also seen what kind of movement can happen like you mentioned the uh not for profit prisons or the for profit prisons being in the, ending in michigan what i think some of the issue is that people just don't know how bad something is i think um there's a contingency of the population that when they hear race, equity, DI, they, they kind of already have their mind made up about, oh, it's not that bad here. And um, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, we're just kind of in tunnel vision. And so right now, um, as I know, when I have certain issues that come up, I become more in tune and I didn't know it was that bad. So my son right now is um, at the Lindaway County Jail, but he's a Washington County resident and he's part of the mental health community. And um, in the last three months, I've learned so much about how messed up the whole jail system is and how there's no connection between the mental health and him even getting his medicine. I mean, there's all these things. So it's, it's no longer a, a piece of paper or something for me. It's like, you know, I've been living this nightmare. And so, um, and I have, um, talk to, I don't know, I would say hundreds of people, I mean, partly because I did fun, I ended up doing fundraising, and I had to say, I had to tell people details about his life in a way that I didn't want to, just to receive the little bit of, of help, so if there's some way to do advocacy where you don't have to do, like, poverty porn or, um, um, pain porn, 
that we can just do it because it's right, because it's not right if there is somebody in um, a jail and they weren't receiving their diabetic or their insulin um, medicine, it would be a whole big outrage. So if they're not receiving their mental health medication. And now I see his, I can see the change. I can see him starting to depreciate. And so like now he's on punishment. He can't use the phone or the, you know what I'm saying? So like, I can't even contact him. And I have I have talked to every mental health, we've done grievances. I've talked to captains and, and the NAACP and the IC, no, um, the ASFC and the ACLU. And I've done all of the things that you're supposed to do and nobody has a path to just get him a piece of medicine. He's had COVID in there, they have COVID outbreaks, they have sack lunches, they haven't had a, a fresh food in almost two months because there's no way to, um, for the people to, to have enough healthy staff to serve food. It's just ridiculous. And so for um, when I hear like, um, what's, what's reasonable or what's doable, I'm, I'm pissed because this is beyond doable. We can do better than this. I've been paying taxes and voting and whatever thing. My my relative is the reason my, I have a great um, grand uncle who was the first voting rights martyr in this country, who was lynched trying to get people to vote in 1940. And, and you know, so it's like, I've invested, our family is invested in this and I still don't have any better treatment than if I had just decided not to do anything. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for motivating us and telling us your story, sharing all of that. Thank you. Um, Eleanor, please, I would like if, to I may, if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I hear the plea in Leslie's voice and I happen to know Leslie. But before, if with all of us on here, is there somebody that knows some place that or how we can get her some help and not just leave her raw like that coming mm -hmm. off this call? I, that hurts my heart. We got to, yeah, well, I mean, with all the people we have here, there's 36 people left here. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody that has some direction that we can give her and let's yeah, leave uh, we'll my talk. information in the chat for her uh because you know i work out of linaway so i did drop my information in the chat for her to uh to assist so hopefully she got that if you have her direct information though lois you can give her my cell number um for linaway county okay i will Anne, and thank you so much for speaking up i have her uh contact okay yeah. thank you mm -hmm. i just couldn't let that go yeah thank you Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to share resources? If it's okay, I will post the link to the fundraiser in the chat. Thank you. Okay. All right, and we will follow up um, with all, all the folks here. And I wanna thank everybody for coming, but before you leave, um, I, I'd like to ask Pastor Harold to come back and, and leave us with some thoughts. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, I think that um, in these um, conversations, a lot has been said. We need to help each other find out where help is, um, connect folks with voter information. And so um, the Washington Regional Organizing Coalition will be holding um, a session about um, how to reach a ballot, how to vote down ballot beyond um, senator and governor and representatives to get some voter education for people. Um, so we will be um, taking the emails that are from the registration and we will let you know when some of that thing, some of those things are happening and try our best to give you more information. I will put into the chat um, the contact information someone ha has. Um, the, the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice has a plethora of information about voting, voting rights, voting access, um, how you can get involved. And so um, we will um, have that information in the chat so you can contact them. And we just wanna say um, what we hope this has done today is helped us to become 
um, more aware that there's more we need to be aware of um, um, before it hits us directly. So that we can do some intervention. Again, um, um, we can impact government and we can impact budgets and um, we can impact elections. And I, um, um, Sister Gail is right. Um, education is necessary. Um, helping folks understand what to do is necessary as well. But hopefully we give you some insight to a, a um, area of our county that is just kind of there and most of us are oblivious to the courts. Um, in the chat, um, there was some information about the elections coming up. Um, I think you might have gotten that information. I'm going to put some in the chat right now and explain what this link is. So I found out about this information um, earlier today. Um, and so there is um, a um, proposed amendment that is coming up that is coming out from, um, I believe, the, um, the um, 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 from the state Supreme Court um, that will basically allow the attorney grievance um, commission to um, initiate disciplinary proceedings um, against a former judge um, who, but for his or her departure from the bench would have been removed from office based on misconduct. Um, so that is, um, something to say that you just can't retire into the sunset or leave and nothing happens. Um, <clears throat> there's a public comment session that runs until July um, 1st. And so if you will click on that, you'll find information about that. Um, and you will, you can um, respond accordingly. Um, someone asked for contact information. Um, and this second link should take you to a Google Doc that will have the contact information for um, um, those who have presented on this panel today. But again, we hope this has opened your eyes. Um, so now when you hear court races, um, we are paying a little bit more attention to that. And um, um, I'm gonna just turn it back over to Eleanor for our final closing. I just wanna thank everyone for sharing your stories um, and passion and ideas for how we can move forward together. We will follow up with everybody that's registered and we will stay connected. Thank you so much and have a good night. Um, yeah. Eleanor, good night. Thank you. Yeah. You need to give access to that Google Doc. It won't open. Thank you. We'll make sure that all of the links are shared with everybody afterward as well. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Sure. Have, have a good night. Good night. No, good to see you, Joe. John, you so too, good John. to see you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Good night.